the Medical School HQ podcast, session number 93. I just think it's a very reasonable thing to do to, for, for med students to be, or, or pre-meds to be saying, hey, let me just explore these options. Let me, let me really find out listening to things like this podcast and in your interviews. I mean, just gets, uh, you know, really valuable information out there for them rather than what they've you know, heard through the grapevine, really go talk to somebody, talk to a military physician, talk to um, people like me who are on the outside now and, and how would they, you know, would you do it all over again type of thing, you know? Hey, this is Z-Dog MD, rapper, physician, legendary turntable health revolutionary, and part-time gardener. And you're listening to the Medical School HQ podcast hosted by the irredeemably awesome Ryan Gray. Hello, and welcome to the Medical School Headquarters Podcast, where we believe that collaboration, not competition, is key to your pre-med success. I'm your host, Dr. Ryan Gray, and in this podcast, we share with you stories, encouragement, and information that you need to know to help you on your path to becoming a physician. I want to let you know that we have a partner magazine, Premed Life Magazine. If you haven't checked them out yet, please do so, premedlife.com. They offer a bi-monthly magazine, and you can see all kinds of cool content on their website, premedlife.com. In today's interview, I'm going to talk to Dr. Chad Hendrickson, who just recently got out of the Army, where he was an Army dermatologist but he's now working in private practice. Chad's going to share his story of applying to the uh, Uniformed Services University of the Health Sciences, or USIS, also known as the the Military Medical School. He's going to talk about choosing the Army over the, the Air Force or the Navy and the discussions that he had with his wife about going into the military medical school versus going to a civilian medical school and all the choices that went along with that. He also is going to give us some advice for what you should be looking at if you're interested in the HPSP or or USIS medical school route. Chad, welcome to the show. Let's start by talking about when you knew you wanted to be a physician. Okay. Well, let's see. You know, I, it wasn't, it wasn't before college. Um, My uncle was a physician's assistant and uh, he was—he played a really prominent role in my life. Um, he was kind of like a a father figure to me. And um, you know, I, he was a physician's assistant, an ortho PA. And so um, it was probably late high school that I decided that I wanted to uh, to be a PA. So I got accepted into a PA program um, in college, and then. Um, it was a couple of years, probably a couple of months into, you know, my first, my first year, my freshman year, I decided, you know what, if I'm going to do this, I want to be a physician. I want to be able to make the decisions. Um, you know, I, I just thought I wanted something bigger than being a PA. So I switched to, to pre-med, um, in undergrad and then, uh, and then kind of that, that was really where I decided that it, that it was, you know, I wanted to be a physician. Interesting. That's. I think that's a, a common uh, split. Is do I do I want to spend four years and all of this debt to go to medical school, or do I want to do two years and a lot less debt and go to PA school? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, it's funny. I mean, I that probably I, you know never really entered my mind. I probably didn't have the foresight. Maybe that's what it was at that <laughs> point. Um, you know, to back up a little bit. Uh, you know, just to full transparency and being really open about it. I was not a stellar student in high school at all. Um, I, I wasn't like, you know, a lot of physicians, um, especially, you know, physicians that end up in my, in my specialty because I'm surrounded by people that were like valedictorian. Then they were top their class in, in med school and, you know, college and then med school and got into Durham. Um, you know, I think my story is probably a little different. I was seriously like, I think, you know, ADHD when I was little and then it was ADD as I got older because the hyperactivity might've gone away, but the ADD didn't go away. Yeah. And, um, you know, and I just never could keep it together. 
um, for grades, although you know everyone around me said, hey, oh, what's the deal, Chad? There's a lot of potential here. What's the problem? And it just never happened. Well, I actually stayed out of um, out of college for a year. I, I literally worked at a golf course because that was my summer job, which was awesome as a kid. I loved working on a golf course. But um, I stayed out for a year. I saw around me for 18 months or so as I worked what happens, you know, when you don't go to college and you just work at a, you know, essentially a dead end job that might be enjoyable for a while, but doesn't stay that way. And so I decided, Hey, I'm, I'm doing this. And that's when I, you know, made the decision to go to college. And it was again, the PA program that I had mentioned, but I got real serious. And, and so going from a a solid C average, literally in high school to, you know, nearly a 4.0 in college with, by the second semester. Wow. Um, so yeah, so I, you know, I, I, I like know. how <laughs> I like how you say a solid C. <laughs> Most yeah, people right. say a solid A, but you're like, no, a solid C. Uh, that's right. The stress is on the <laughs> solid C. But I, I think I don't know. I think it's um, I think it's really important for people to hear that. You know. Yeah. Um, for people to know what the real story is behind, you know, a, they see a physician especially, and they're like, oh well, you know. They're always been a hard, a hard charger and, and always doing really well. And, you know, they may even think, well, there's no chance for me. I, I, you know, and you said sort of thinking about the, the split there, PA and, and physician and people thinking about, you know, the, the cost of it and that kind of thing. I mean, like I said, the, the cost didn't enter in. For me, it was just kind of, well, let's see if I'm going to be able to make it in college. And once I decide, oh, I can, I can do this and my friends around me that were dropping out of pre-med and I was, and I was doing well. And so it just kind of, you know, it just kind of went from there. Yeah. It's, it sounded like once you had that goal, then everything kind of lined up for you. You there, Ryan? Yeah. Oh, yep. It, it sounded like once you had that goal that everything kind of lined up for you. Uh, yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, I, I think it was more or less once I knew I could do it, you know, and, and in some people's lives, their, their, their level of maturity and their level of development, it happens at different times for different people. And I still find that, you know, I still find that it seems like, I, you know, people say you're, you're coming into your own, you're, you know, for me, it for some reason has always happened a little bit later. And some of these things that I'm doing now in my life, um, I feel like is, again, just kind of a little bit later, but it's, it's fun that way, too, because it, it keeps uh, keeps life interesting. Good. So let's talk about once you go through your undergrad and you're mm-hmm. applying to medical schools, what drew you towards applying to USIS so that the military medical school, as we call it? Yeah. Well, um, so right after after college, I was not sure what I wanted to do. I was kind of seriously geeking out in college and thought I might want to go do an MD, PhD program. So I, uh, I applied to the National Institutes of Health for a, a pre-intramural research training award, or they call them pre-ERDAS, um, which is essentially to go be a very, very low-paid uh, 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 scut monkey, as we, as we call it sometimes in, you know, in medical school. I always scutted out to just do benchtop research at a lab at NIH, and I did that for a year. Um, and while I was there, I met this really interesting guy who was a neurologist, and uh, he was uh, in the public health service, so he wore a uniform, but uh, it wasn't a you know, military branch. But, you know, he said to me, hey, Chad, you know, here's the deal. If you want to do research, you can do research as an MD or as a PhD, but if you want to see patients, if you want to treat patients, you want to get your MD. And at the time I was deciding I didn't want to do the research part of it so much. So I thought, well, okay, so, so med school is the thing for me. Um, and he, uh, you know, kind of had told me about the medical school, which is right across the street from National Institutes of Health in Bethesda, um, which is, you know, USIS or Uniform Services University, the military med school. Um, and, uh, and then I had, there was another uh, guy there, it was actually a PhD that ended up going to USIS a year ahead of me. Uh, and same deal, you know, he kind of told me about it. So I knew it was there, but I wasn't necessarily that interested in it and was actually going um, to go do a master's program. They have a, a program at Georgetown University there. I mean, just down the street from USIS and down the street from NIH that um, that is a master's in physiology and biophysics. And what you'll find is that it, that program is like a med school prep is essentially what it is. It's an accelerated 
uh, one year master's program. You're taking a lot of your classes with the first year med students. And it's like a med school prep. And so I was going into that. Um, and then at the end of that year, they take a certain number of students from that. And I got into Georgetown and then I also had applied to USIS. Um, and so, uh, you know, my, my, I was married at the time. My wife, um, was working, she was a respiratory therapist working at Fairfax hospital, working all at night. And I was, you know, at school all day. So we hardly ever saw each other. Um, and so when I went and visited USIS, uh, I was really impressed with the facilities, the people, um, especially comparing it to Georgetown where I was at, which is a, you know, fairly prestigious med school. And, um, you know, uh, having spent that year there at Georgetown, I thought, wow, I mean, I really like the way this place stacks up against Georgetown. And then you add in that Georgetown's about $40,000 a year to go <laughs> and USIS pays you that much. Yep. I mean, it's amazing flip. So that's an $80,000 a year difference. <laughs> And, and so, um, that really did factor in at the time, might not have, like we had talked about the dollars and cents earlier on, but it really factored in when I was married and, you know, knew that, you know, although my wife was working, she really wanted to be a homemaker. So, um, yeah, turned down the Georgetown acceptance and went to USIS and, and was really, really happy with it. I want to dig in a little bit more. If, if you can remember back then, Mm -hmm. those discussions that you had with your wife of, okay, yes, I'm going to get paid to go to medical school, but on the back end, there's this this commitment that the I'm commitment. giving to to serve the country and to be a military person, and we're going to move, and I'm going to get deployed and all this other stuff. What what went into those discussions? Yeah. Yeah, it, it was a while ago. <laughs> this was uh, uh, 1997, 1998. Um, but, you know, I do, I mean, I mean, first of all, I have an amazing wife. She's always been extremely supportive. I mean, she's a great sounding board. So we sat down and we talked about it and said, hey, we can, you know, we can start our family earlier, um, you know, and, and here's, here's the pros and the cons. She really said, you know, I mean, though, in, in the discussions, it really boiled down to, so, you know, what do you want to do, Chad? You know, um, you know, if you want to go to Georgetown, if you feel like this is a better decision, go to Georgetown. I mean, I'll keep working and it's going to be another four years of that, but then you start getting paid and we'll go from there. Um, and if you want to go to USIS and, and, uh, she knew, I mean, my, my family had a, a fairly strong military background. My, my dad was an air force pilot and, um, you know, multiple other family members that were in the military. So there certainly wasn't an aversion, although I hadn't done ROTC, I hadn't done, um, a lot of the other things, you no know, academy type stuff, you know, that a lot of the guys that end up uh, guys, men and women that end up at, um, at USIS have done that stuff. So, um, again, uh, we just, you know, had a very frank conversation about that stuff and she wasn't particularly worried about, you know, the, the commitment part and neither was I, although as we may get into, you know, USIS is a, um, a longer commitment than other military scholarship programs. Yeah. So it's it's seven years after residency as opposed to four. But uh, I don't know. It really came down to, hey, you know, for your education and for your career, what do you think is the best decision? And and that's a decision we made. OK. So when you go to USIS, there's Army, there's Navy, there's Air Force. Right. What what drew you to the Army? You said your dad was an Air Force pilot. <laughs> Yeah, actually, um, I, when I went and interviewed, the way it works is you, you interview and then when you get your acceptance, you say, uh, essentially what, what branch of the service you want to go into. Well, um, as you may know, the, the air force is sometimes viewed as, um, you know, sort of the, the country club of the, of the three. (laughs) Obviously (laughs) it's the smartest choice. (laughs) So, so I had said, uh, air force and it was, it was a family thing too. Yes. Oh yeah. Air force this, this, I mean, I didn't really have any, any real strong preferences, but, um, essentially I said, okay, here's, here's how it stacks up. We are filling the class up and we've already filled the 50 slots or whatever for the air force. And cause that's essentially, it filled up, you know, right at the beginning. And, uh, I said, okay. And they said, so you can get on the waiting list and there's a good chance, you know, that when people decide they're not coming or whatever, there'll be spots that open up. Um, or you can have a spot guaranteed in one of the other two. And, um, and so the next, the next best for me was army. I wasn't, I wasn't interested in boats. Uh, (laughs) so, so I said, no, I'll, I'll take it right now. I mean, I was just so interested in getting started 
and uh, going to to use this that I said, nope, I'll take the Army spot. Okay. Now, looking back at your time as a medical student at USIS, are were you thought of and did you think of yourself as a normal medical student or were you a military person that happened to be going to medical school? Yeah. Um, it's interesting because, you know, we do wear the uniform every day and you are expected to, um, you know, maintain that, that level of professionalism um, and, what we, you know, and military bearing uh, while you're there. But it's certainly, um, you know, it's a different atmosphere compared to the regular military, let's say. But, I, you know, I, I, they stress that it's med school student, you know, you're a med student first and you're an officer second. Um, and, uh, and so, you know, there, there aren't a lot of requirements. You're not, you're not getting informations. There aren't generally, at least when I was there, I and mean, of course I'm speaking to when I was there, which was 98 to 2002, um, there was not mandatory PT, you know, physical training. Mm-hmm. You did have mandatory physical, you know, PT tests or the physical training tests that you had to pass. So you had to maintain your weight standards and you had to maintain your physical fitness, but it was essentially on you to do that. Yeah. So they really stress that, hey, we essentially we, we, we want to stay out of these people's way because we know that, you know, medical school is not is not easy and we don't want to burden them with all these other requirements because we want them to be first and foremost really good doctors. So during your your test, you're not dropping and doing 20 push ups in between every question. Not so much, unless, you know, unless you want to. Unless you're a gunner. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. So, I mean, <laughs> you know, it's interesting, too, because. Um, it's an it's a nice mix. You've got uh, you know prior service folks that are coming in there. Some of which and 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 to get into it a little bit deeper, everybody comes in as the same rank. So everyone's a second lieutenant. So the lowest rank you know that you can be um, and be an officer. And you're direct commissioned in. Um, everybody has to go to the officer basic course, um, but uh, and, and you do that you know before med school. Yeah, even starts. But you also have these prior service people. And interestingly enough, some of them were higher ranking officers. And in our class, like as, as high as 04. Um, so they were, you know, major, you know, equivalent in the army. They go down to second lieutenant Wow. when, when they come to school. So, you know, so they're giving up something too, but it's awesome to have them. So you got some people that are literally like in their thirties, you know, with a bunch of young, you know, 20 somethings, but everyone's a lieutenant. Everyone stayed that second lieutenant through all four years of med school. Uh, and then you get promoted uh, right to uh, the 03. So you skip a rank and then go all the way to 03 when you graduate. Very cool. Yeah. It's very similar to to the HPSP scholarship that I went to school on. You're, mm-hmm. you're considered a second lieutenant when you're doing all your active duty stuff. And then as soon as you graduate, then you, you, you pin on the 03 captain for Air Force. Right. So cool. Yeah. So you're a dermatologist. You you applied for dermatology residency right out of USIS, I'm assuming? Right. How did that look to you, and did that weigh into your factor of going to USIS, knowing that there's this big question mark of whether or not you could actually be allowed, as, as most students ask me about, did they allowed you to do dermatology. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, so here's the way it works coming out of USIS. Um, if there's uh, an available residency that you match with in the military, then you are required to do that residency. So the sort of allowing you to do it is this, I, I guess, one, you have to match with a residency just like everybody else does. Um, but if you match with one on the outside and then also with one inside the military, they, at that time required you to, to go to the military, um, residency. And I, you know, as far as I knew, that wasn't a huge issue amongst my classmates. Um, now in my situation, I was really fortunate. The year I graduated was the first year that the army, um, was taking, people straight into some select residencies like Durham. And so I went straight out of med school into my internship and my three years of Durham residency, and then I was done. Before that, 
um, for time immemorial, it was that you had to go and do kind of pay your dues. And so these people would go to Korea or somewhere right out of um, internship. Usually they'd go do their internship after med school and then they'd go to Korea or they'd go to some place that was um, a hardship tour for anywhere from one to four years to get then back into one of the tougher, you know, more select residencies like dermatology. So, uh, you know, it was just, I was really fortunate. It was amazing timing. Um, everything, you know, fell in line. I mean, you know, to get into the residence, you still had to match with it, which they had their standards for, um, you know, for board scores and, and, and grades and, and interviewing and working with them and all that kind of stuff. But, um, I got in and there were people still out in the field, we called it, you know, out in Korea and all these other places trying to get in. So it was a very interesting time. Um, But now that's the standard. You can generally go in the Army. Now it's different in other forces. um, But in the Army, in our case, you could go straight in. um, And that's what happened. That's what I was fortunate to happen for me. Wow. Sounds sounds like a very... uh perfect timing for you yeah it was it's all about you know what they say it's all about the timing man yeah. and it is it really is that's awesome so what is it like to practice as a dermatologist in the army uh you know i mean most days it's like being a der- you know dermatologist anywhere else i mean our population's a little different in that you know i had a much you know younger population so in, in certain places, there would be a lot less, let's say, skin cancer. Maybe there'd be a higher proportion of, you know, acne and other things that, you know, younger people are going to have. But the truth of the matter is a lot of the places, especially in the U.S., I mean, I did spend four years outside the U.S., but in the U.S., you've got a lot of retirees that you're taking care of. So they bring, you know, that demographic to your office. And so my days are, are what uh, most dermatologist days are like. I see a lot of, you know, acne, rosacea skin cancer, eczema, you know, the, the top five or 10 diagnoses are what kind of roll in the door, um, you know, every day. And so it really, it really isn't much different, uh, being in these, um, you know, facilities. I was in one, you know, for training, I was at Brook Army Medical Center. So it was a big medical treatment facility. After that, my first assignment was at, um, Fort Eustis, which is in the Tidewater area of Virginia. And so that was a very small facility, more like a health center, a health clinic. Um, and so I didn't necessarily have the bigger cases, the referral cases that I would have been seeing at the bigger hospitals. And then my my um, my last four years was at Launstuhl, which is the army um, medical center in Germany where all the soldiers are flown to from Iraq and Afghanistan and those those theaters um, when they're injured. So that was that was a unique experience, too. Interesting. And now, now you're out at, at what point in, in your process, did you have those discussions with your wife and with yourself to say, okay, I've, I've done my time, my commitments up, I can either stay in and and get my retirement and and then go work uh, in private practice or I'm just going to get out now. What what kind of decision making was that? Yeah, um, that wasn't that wasn't an easy decision. I mean, I think a lot of people, for a lot of people, it is. They're done with their commitment, and um, they've thought from the very beginning that they're going to get out. Um, and it's, it's interesting. Some people that that do think they're getting out are the ones that stay in for 20 years. Um, but in my case, I I was always just kind of on the fence, saying, "Hey, well, let's see what happens." Um, my commitment was over last year in 2013. So that was seven years as an active duty dermatologist. Um, and we were living in Germany, which was a phenomenal experience. Um, we had our kids there, um, in Germany and German schools and, and, you know, the travel was amazing. Um, we were thinking about staying, you know, staying on for another tour, maybe doing six or eight years there, but, uh, at the same time, there was a strong pull to get out of the military to move home uh, to to Pennsylvania. Both my wife and I are from the same small town in Pennsylvania. Both of our families are here, um, and so all the you know grandparents and aunts and uncles and cousins and everybody else that our kids had never had the chance to live with. I mean, they've had all these amazing opportunities as you know quote military brats, um, but you know they hadn't had the chance to live with family, and so we had a lot of 
long, hard conversations about, you know, kind of weighing those pros and cons. I mean, these amazing opportunities to live abroad and have our kids have this really diverse experience. But we decided that at that point, some of our kids hit in their teenage years that if it wasn't then, then it was probably going to be never. Um, so you, uh, we made the decision to get out. I really thought I was going to become a reservist because I have, I have nine more years that I would need to get in, uh, in order to get 20 years and get a retirement. Um, but when I got out and, and, you know, kind of visited a, a local reservist, um, unit and just kind of waited a little while and, and started working and just decided that no, it's, it's really not for me right now. So, so I'm out, out and I'm not, I don't have any connection at all right now. And again, let's see how it goes. Is that something later on you can go back and do some guard time or reserve time and, and make up those years? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. There's different ways to fulfill your, your commitment, your requirement rather to hit 20 years. You can, you can go back at just about any time if they'll take you. In other words, if you're, you know, uh, medically fit and it's a specialty, let's say that they wanted to bring back into the military. I could go back um, at just about any age. I think the mandatory retirement age is somewhere around 67, 68. So to get those nine years, I could even go back in my late 50s and get those years after having practiced, you know, nearly 20 years in, in civilian life. You can also roll it into um, other federal service. So there's people that go and work for the VA or work for the government in some other, um, you know, department. And uh, they can get credit for the years they had in the military and finish out that way, too. So there's, there's lots of different ways to do it. That's awesome. Yeah. Looking back at your decision to go to, to USIS instead of Georgetown and, and, and quote-unquote giving up seven years of your life to, to serve and to, to be a, an Army officer, it's interesting. You said you're a medical student first in medical school and an officer, officer second. But I think on the outside, once you're actually graduated and, and are an officer, you're an officer first and a medical person second. Right. Yeah, that's that's kind of the way um, it's pitched, you know. But I, I think most doctors would say that, um, you know, you kind of you, you it's a, this duality. You really do just live them both at the same time. I mean, if I think if people are good doctors uh, and good officers then, you know, they're upholding the, you know, the standards, high standards for both of those. Um, and so I, it, I don't know, to me, there was never any conflict. Um, you know, I did, I was deployed. I was, uh, I was deployed to Iraq in 2007, 2008. So it was during the surge and I wasn't deployed as a dermatologist. And I mean, a lot of people were super, super, uh, angry, uh, about being sent you know, we say downrange, you know, to, into combat um, operation theater as and not even in their specialty. I was sent as a general medical officer. So I was in a small clinic seeing all comers. Um, but, you know, I just I said, well, hey, you know, I, I've been trained as a physician and I, I did my internship and I'm going to, you know, this is what they want me to fulfill. I'm going to do the best I can. And then, you know, you get there and you find out that, you know, there's different specialists and you almost set up your own, you know, specialty referral services. And so I had people flying in on helicopters to see me for skin issues and I was cutting out skin cancers. And yeah, so I was also taking care of headaches and, you know, gyne issues and, uh, you know, whatever, all kinds of stuff. But, um, you know, it was an amazing, invaluable experience. And that part, you know, sort of bolstered the officer side of things. Um more than any other experience I'd had. I mean, I was almost a major. In fact, I pinned on major when I was downrange in Iraq. And I was back in my clinic, you know, before I was deployed thinking, you know, I, I need to go. Uh, here's these young guys. They're in their early 20s. They've been downrange two times, three times already, whatever. And I don't even, you know, speak the lingo. And so I, I really wanted that experience. And it was one of the singular most important experiences in my life. Yeah, that's that's phenomenal. And I think... It, the the question that I was going to ask you is if if you thought the the seven years of serving has hampered your life now that mm -hmm. you're in private practice and do you feel like you're behind the curve? But it sounds like some of these experiences that you had as a military physician far outweigh what you may have missed working in private practice the whole time. Yeah, I, I would absolutely agree with that. I mean, there's certain things that I'm not as savvy about. 
being, you know, just, just now learning about, but they're, they're the kind of things, you know, whether it's business operation or, or insurance type, you know, dealing with the, you know, insurance companies. And I, you know, maybe I'm not as business savvy as, as some would be at, at this point, had they not done what I did, but I, I, yeah, I had so many amazing experiences and, and life broadening experiences in the military. I wouldn't, I wouldn't trade it for anything. I can learn all this other business stuff, but none of those people can go and say they, you know, took care of people in Iraq. Uh, yeah, that's awesome. So for a pre-med student looking at going to USIS or looking at maybe the HPSP scholarship, what advice do you have for them? What questions maybe can they ask themselves, ask their family members of whether or not committing to, to serving the country and, and being a military physician is right for them? Yeah, you know, I guess the big thing is, you know, for for an individual, obviously, I mean, they may not even be thinking about it if they've got some, um, you know, aversion to to the military, or if their you know family has has, has strong negative opinions about the military for one reason or another. Um, but uh, you know, I, I think the training opportunities are amazing. I mean, we could talk all day about you know the kind of stuff we as military physicians maybe get to do that, that civilian uh, med students and physicians don't get to do. I mean, <laughs> there's guys that, uh, men and women that packed up their household belongings, put it in storage for their entire third year of medical school. And they traveled and did rotations abroad and around the country for every single rotation, you know? And I, you're not going to run into civilians that are able to do that kind of stuff. It, yeah. It's not easy. It's It's just not easy. So, um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, if you're thinking, let's say uh, you're, you're very strongly, uh, you know, leaning towards research, uh, that, that may not be obviously as, as strong in, in the military. It's a lot more sort of practical. They're not training researchers. They're training docs to go take care of people all over the world and in all kinds of situations. So I would think that, you know, uh, from, from a research standpoint, although there are places, you know, in the military that you can do, you can do that. It's probably not as strong if that's something that you're, that's a bent that you're, you know, that you're leaning towards. But um, I just think it's a very reasonable thing to do to, for, for med students to be, or, or pre-meds to be saying, hey, let me just explore these options. Let me, let me really find out listening to things like this podcast and in your interviews. I mean, just gets, uh, you know, really valuable information out there for them rather than what they've you know, heard through the grapevine, really go talk to somebody, talk to a military physician, talk to um, people like me who are on the outside now. And, and how would they, you know, would you do it all over again type of thing, you know? Yeah. And would you? I would. I would. I. It's funny. I, I've uh, asked myself that a lot of times and I still do um, on a regular basis, you know, cause you change, you're a different person every day when you get up. And especially after you've been out for a little while and you keep saying to yourself, okay, um, did I just have a, you know, a rosy disposition about it when I was in, or, or now do I still say what I do it all over again? And I, I absolutely would. Good. Yeah. It's a good thing. Now you have a podcast about dermatology, right? Let's talk about that for a minute. Yeah. So that's something that, um, I don't, I don't know that my interest in podcasting grew, uh, or, or was growing yet when I was in the military still, when I was in Germany, um, I had a good friend. He's a doc too. His name's George Smolinski and, uh, he's a physical medicine and rehab doc still living in Germany. Really great guy, uh, has some business ventures, some online stuff, you know, and everything while he's, uh, you know, in, in the military and we got to having a, a small mastermind together. And, and, you know, one of the things I started doing was listening to podcasting and of you know, entrepreneurial minded type thing, you know, one of the first ones everybody runs across is John Lee Dumas, you know, and I started listening to Entrepreneur on Fire while I was in Germany still and in the military. Um, and then, you know, I guess it just, it just grew into, Hey, you know, this is interesting. I, I'm interested in some of the entrepreneurial part, the online business, um, and the podcast also just is, it's an interesting platform. I mean, it's a great way to connect with people more so, you know, more so than a blog, which I have a blog too, but you know, the podcasting people get to hear you and they really connect with you more. And I think it's, it's an amazing thing for physicians. I think it's a little scary for physicians to actually be podcasting and blogging about what we do about medicine because of the, you know, litigious nature of our society. But 
I think if, again, if, you know, if the intent is, man, this is amazing. I can reach people on such a, a higher level. I mean, I can, in my clinic, if I'm a busy day, I'll see 35 patients, right? But if a podcast is good quality podcast, it's, you know, it could be downloaded, you know, thousands or tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of times a month. And, you know, your ability to get good information to people, because there's so much misinformation out there, um, they, your ability to get good information out to many, many people is just, you know, multiplied so many fold. Yeah. And so you podcast about dermatological issues for patients, not for patients, right. not talking to dermatologists. No, no. And I, it's funny because I had originally when I was taking a, I was, I literally took a podcasting course to learn how to do it. It was like a crash course, you know? Um, and I, it, it, one of the first things that the, the guy that teaches, it says, listen, you need to figure out what you're going to podcast about, why you're going to podcast about. It. And I really thought I was going to do a podcast, um, for physicians and it wasn't long. It, it, I think it may have been shortly after I finished the course. I decided, no, no, you know what? What I can sit and talk about ad nauseum because of my knowledge base and what I enjoy talking about too is is derm. And I, I would rather actually reach out to that population rather than necessarily physicians at this point. So that's why I went with um, that platform and and doing derm. So you know, it's obviously it's not making diagnoses, not doing anything like that, but it's getting information out there about diseases that people are going online and searching about uh, all the time. Yeah. So where can where can people find your podcast and maybe get an idea of what you do to see if they might be interested in doing something similar when they're out practicing? Yeah. Um, so the the podcast is on iTunes and it's on Stitcher Radio. Um, it's called Dermatology House Call with Dr. Chad Hendrickson. Um, and then I also um, have a blog at drchadhendrickson.com. So that's drchadhendrickson.com. And, um, and then there's, you know, actually my podcast. You can, if you don't have the, you know, iTunes or Stitch or anything like that, it's easy. You can, you can listen to it right there on the website. Awesome. Yeah. Now, Chad, before I let you go, what general piece of advice would you have for a, a pre-med that maybe has just totally no interest in going in the military, but it's just that, that pre-med out there struggling on their path? Yeah. You know, I went into every single one of my rotations. So let's say whether it's, you know, before you go to med school or while you're in med school, I went in, I went into every rotation saying, you know what, this is going to be the one I'm, I'm going to just give it my all. I was always excited. I, you know, I took a lot of energy into these rotations and, uh, you know, one by one, I kind of checked them off and said, well, you know, even though I came into it saying this could be the one for me, I checked it off. I was like, no, th that's not the one for me. I mean, a lot of people go into school, med school, uh, even pre-med saying with these, you know, I'm going to be an orthopedic surgeon or I'm going to be, you know, whatever family power, I'm going to do whatever. Um, I, I think going in with an open mind and just thinking every single one of them could be the one, you know, because what ends up happening is you find not only what you like to do, but you will really start to you identify with the personalities oftentimes in certain specialties. And I, I think a lot of a lot of you know doctors would say that, yeah, I just found out that I was kind of that kind of person. Um, so, go, you know, you know put a ton of energy into everything and, and, and really truly go into each um, new learning experience thinking, hey, this might be the thing that I do the rest of my life. And it wasn't until I walked into a derm rotation and I, I fell in love with derm just overnight. I mean, my first day was like, wow, it was such an eye-opening experience. I said, I love this. It's so you know fast-paced. It's uh, you know so diverse. I can do surgery. I can, you know, use lasers. I can, you know, I'm going to do a lot of procedures. And so, you, you know, and it's very, very interactive with patients. So, um, yeah, that's what I would say. Keep your, keep your eyes and ears open, keep an open mind and, um, and you'll find what it is truly you want to do. All right. Again, that was Chad Hendrickson. You can find him at drchadhendrickson.com and I'll have links to that in the show notes which you can always find at medicalschoolhq.net slash and then the session number. This session number is 93. So medicalschoolhq.net slash 93. I, I do want to take a minute to thank 
uh, several people that wrote us amazing five star reviews. M Neil seven three three said best pre med advising podcast. Uh, we sup twelve said best pre med pre med resource I have found. And dangling in the forest says the medical school HQ podcast has provided me with plenty of useful tips and information. I listen to it on the way to my MCAT review class. So thank you to those three listeners that left us five-star ratings and reviews. They drive almost everything that we do here. The feedback that we get is amazing and encourages us to continue to find great guests and continue to put out these podcasts every week for you. So please, if you haven't, take a minute. Go to medicalschoolhq.net slash iTunes. It'll only take a minute, I promise. If you haven't taken the MCAT yet, go to freemcatgift.com and download our 30-plus page report all about tips and tricks for the MCAT, including some discount codes as well for test prep. Again, I hope you enjoyed today's podcast, and more importantly, I hope what you learned you'll take and you'll move forward and you'll grow and you'll make your path even that much better. Please join us next time here at the Medical School Headquarters.